So today, I'm going to be talking about Roy Staunton. This is a case that many of you may be familiar with. It was covered in the media, originally in the New York Times, but quickly moved to many other media outlets. It caused rage in the public. It caused fear. It caused many people to believe this type of headline, that doctors don't know what they're doing that error is rampant. It also caused an outrage in the physician community. When this article was written, the author put the name of the physician that they felt made errors in the paper. The original article received more than 1,600 um, comments, most of them from physicians, most of them very negative. The author was uh, called into question because he knew this family he was called into question if he had any conflict of interest. But I would ask today that we focus in a different way on this case. When you really look at the details, you will see that there were errors that were made. And I think that as physicians, we somewhat um, lost that fact in our outrage over how our profession was per portrayed in the media. There were errors that were made. Of course, they're multifactorial. There was not one person to blame. But I want to step through this case, fact by fact, using the actual medical record, and I want you to ask yourself what you can take away from this that's going to make you better. Some things are going to be very much in your control. It's in your control to be up to date, to be on that cutting edge standard of care about this topic, about pediatric sepsis. It's in your control to be very deliberate when you discharge a patient, to make sure that you're not making a high-risk discharge. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, questions to ask yourself and ways to do that. And finally, the onus is on us to continue to fight and focus and work on the system. There were quite a few system errors in this case. And so when you go back, I want you to ask yourself, what can you do better? What can you continue to fight for in the system to improve care so that we don't have more cases that are similar to this? Rory Staunton was a 12-year-old that lived in New York City. He was kind, he was smart, funny, a very normal kid. He was known, really, to fight for the underdog, and actually, at his school, was part of a large campaign that was also on a national level to help us to change the way that we describe people with disabilities. Rory fought for the underdog. He was a normal kid that did normal things. On the day before he became ill, he played basketball. It was a normal game. When kids play basketball, they fall, they get hurt. Rory said he took a tumble that day. He had an abrasion to his arm. He told his mom he had just needed a Band-Aid. It was a non-event, or so they thought. Late that night after the game, uh, Rory began to feel ill, and then by the next morning was vomiting, complaining of very severe leg pain, and it spiked a fever. So his parents called their pediatrician's office and took him in. At the pediatrician's office, again, Rory's main complaints were vomiting and pain, and he was found there to have a temperature of 101. The doctor talked to the family, took the history, examined Rory. The parents even told her about this abrasion to his arm, which she examined. Um, it didn't look like a big deal. She felt that this was a stomach virus, and that's what she told Roy's parents, and felt that his pain and other symptoms were because he was dehydrated, and that he needed to go to the emergency department and get, get IV fluids. Again, nothing's out of the ordinary here. In fact, she didn't just want to send him to any emergency department. She sent him to the local academic center, one that was award-winning, one that had many specialties that were rated uh, top in their field. Roy's parents left that pediatrician's office thinking that things were going to be better, that all he needed was IV fluids. But what they didn't know at the time was that Rory already had very abnormal vital signs. And the parents and the pediatrician had a discussion about some skin changes, not the abrasion, but to his extremities. She used the word modeling, and that they remembered that they had had that discussion. Again, his temperature at this time was 101. Once they got to hospital, to hospital's triage, his vital signs were very similar. Um, his temperature, though, now was 100, and you'll notice that he's still tachycardic, borderline hypotensive, and mildly tachypnic. 
He was quickly seen there in the ED. The ED physician saw him, again, took a history, did a physical, documented on the chart. The medical decision-making said simply, IV fluids, comma, Zofran, comma, reeval. And that's just what happened. Rory was reevaluated, felt to be improved, the single word improved was written, and then his discharge papers were printed at 2114. This was only about two hours after he arrived, so that was the total length of his ED visit. The timeline gets important here because it's noted in the records that at 2124, so nine to 10 minutes after his discharge papers were printed, these vitals were documented in the chart. He was still tachycardic. He was still tachypnic, still febrile. Rory's parents said that someone came in and told them it was just the common flu. He was going to keep vomiting, maybe have some diarrhea, but that he was going to get better. They mentioned that they had to help him walk out because he still had such severe leg pain and that he was shaking with chills and actually took his mom's jacket, a very feminine jacket for a large boy, um, because he was so cold. A few hours after Rory left, these labs resulted. He had a white count of 14.7 and bands of 53%. There's no documentation that these results were ever communicated to anybody that was part of his healthcare team. Rory continued to vomit through the night. He woke up the next morning, um, and his parents noticed he had some cyanosis around his lips. They noticed that that changing to his skin now had spread through all his extremities. They called his pediatrician back, who said to go to immediately to the emergency department. When Rory arrived, he was found to be in florid septic shock. And he was dead within two days. There's nothing worse than a case about a child dying. There's not much worse things that we see especially a child that was otherwise healthy, where this was so unexpected. And then on top of that, this was a case where not only had this been a healthy child, not only did he die, but there were questions about it. Was this preventable? Were there clues? What was missed? Those parents asked those questions in the ED. They asked the question in the ICU. The statement was, you sent us home, and this happened. You told us we were going to be fine, and we weren't. And so again, I will ask that we look at this case and see what we can do better. Personally, I will tell you that I remember the first time I read the article about Rory Staunton's case. Um, I, had heard, I had heard about it a little bit online of the complaints from our profession about the article, and I read it myself. And I just remember having the thought go through my head of, what can I do? How can this not be me? And I meant that in a couple different ways. Um, I'm a mom. I have two little kids. I cannot get my mind around the concept of being told that they had a stomach virus and then being dead two days later. How can that not be me? I also very much related to this physician whose name was in the paper. Um, she's well-trained. She was described by her colleagues as described by her colleagues as hypervigilant. She was hard at work that night. I'm sure it was really busy. She was doing her job. And now she has to carry the weight of this case that is on the world stage without a chance to defend herself. Nobody knows exactly what she knew, what she didn't, what happened. All we know is that it happened and that her name is forever linked to that. So I wanted to do something. I felt like I had to do something after reading this, um, trying to answer the question of why it would be too tough, but I did think that we could continue with education. And so I was able to work with actually the author of the New York Times piece and through him the family to get all the medical records. And we actually were able to build a simulation experience. This was done at Carolina's Medical Center. A simulation experience that was entirely based on Rory's case and all the data that was associated with it. And it really had three objectives. We wanted to help people recognize sepsis. We wanted to help our providers know how to provide immediate care. And then we wanted to really explore the preventable errors that were associated with this case. And I will tell you guys that I have the same objectives for you today. So let's start with recognition. So that's the first step. Can you recognize pediatric sepsis? Do you have a protocol you follow? Do you have a way to recognize it? Since Rory's case, many hospitals have actually implemented a protocol 
this is an example. Oh, sorry. The one thing I wanted to mention is it's hard. The reason it's hard to find pediatric sepsis is that it looks like a needle in the haystack in a busy winter when you've got all these kids with runny nose, with fevers, and your department looks like this. How do you pick out that needle in the haystack that actually is the one that has early sepsis and that could have an outcome similar to worries? So this is an example of a pediatric sepsis score. Um, these were, there are many of them very similar through hospitals across the country. The thing that they have in common is that they focus on abnormal vital signs per age, abnormal physical exam findings, and then high-risk patients um, based on them being neonates, based on them having other comorbidities, kids that would be at risk for sepsis. So in recognizing this, I want to talk about a couple things. One is about vital signs and why this is tricky in kids. The reason that it's tricky in kids is really threefold. One is that those vital signs are age dependent. Between the ages, there are different ranges. It's hard to remember. And so I would highly recommend that you have a chart posted in your triage and that you have a way through your phone, through a card, whatever it takes, so that you can easily reference those normal vital signs so that you can recognize when a child has abnormal vital signs. The other thing that I want to mention here is that Rory was actually the size of, a, of an adult. He was 74 kilos. That's a little bit larger than what we consider an average adult, but he was only 12. And what I think happened here is that he went in, that was an emergency department that primarily sees kids. You think about when you see kids, especially toddlers, it's not uncommon to see heart rates, 130s, 140s, 150s, 190s in a screaming infant. And that might not mean danger, but in a 12-year-old, the size of an adult, 140 means something. In your adult ED, if a patient's coming back with a heart in the 140s, it gets your attention. But it did not get their attention. And so we cannot leave out our adolescents, and we need to think about their vital signs really in the perspective of, of their, both their age and their weight. So who sees a lot of tachycardic kids? I sometimes feel like in the winter, every single kid I see is tachycardic, but they certainly don't all have sepsis, severe sepsis, moving to septic shock. There's really two reasons why, and you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with both of them. So this is one. I sometimes think that there's someone or something out at triage that's poking kids. I can think of, you know, tons of presentations from residents about kids with abnormal vital signs, and the first thing they say is, well, they were crying. I'm sure it's fine, they were crying. And then the second reason that we see lots of kids with tachycardia is because they're febrile, and that will cause you to be tachycardic. So one trick of the trade is that you can use this fever-adjusted rule that once they develop a fever, if you add 10 beats a minute and five breaths a minute, you can actually calculate to figure out a normalized set of vital signs so that you can tell if this is somebody that has tachycardia out of proportion of their fever or if it's proportional to the temperature that they have. The other trick is to get that kid on mom's lap, get them the most comfortable so that you can get accurate data and make decisions on what you want to do next. The other thing that's important in kids and adults both is your physical exam. So you want to look at the skin, you want to feel the pulses, that's key in picking up changes. And again, there is reports from Roy's parents that the word modeling was used, even when they were at the pediatrician's office, but there is no report that that information was ever carried over to the emergency department, that it was noted there and it doesn't find its way into the chart. Once you identify that you have a child that you're concerned about early sepsis, the next thing is treatment. And there really are just a few steps, but they're key, and I just want to run through them. I know that there was a whole day on pediatrics earlier in this conference, and that's not necessarily our focus, but I want to make sure that everybody at least has the first couple steps that you need to treat a child once you realize that they're very ill. So the first thing is rapid access. Rule of thumb is that it's two tries or 90 seconds, whichever one comes first, and then you need to get out your I.O. The second is your rapid flu fluid bolus. What would be the fastest, what are the numbers you put in to get the fastest rate on that pump? And forgive me if it's not the same, not in America, but in America, what is the nurse going to put in to get the fastest rate on that pump? They put in 99999, that gives you the fastest rate, and that's still a very slow rate. So with these kids, when they need a rapid fluid bolus, I highly recommend that you use a three-way stopcock, and you can actually, with a large syringe, sometimes very quickly within minutes, get that entire fluid bolus in. And then the next step is that you want to reevaluate the child. With kids, thankfully, it's a little bit easier. So once you do start to fluid resuscitate them, you can recheck their cap refill, you can feel that liver edge come down. There are very easy, easy ways, and again, easier than adults, I think, to really see, to assess if your fluids are working. 
So IV access, rapid fluid bolus, and then you want to get age-appropriate and comorbidity-appropriate antibiotics on within 60 minutes. When you're getting that IV, get blood and check their glucose. Kids are highly susceptible to hypoglycemia when they're this sick. And it's a, it is a poor outcome pretender when they are hypoglycemic. And then finally, one more thing that I wanted to address is airway. So with really sick kids, most of the time we're talking airway, airway, airway. But in a septic child, fluid resuscitate them first. So do not rush to intubate that child. You want to fluid resuscitate them first, and then, if they need it, intubate them. Now, certainly if they're in fluid respiratory distress, that's a different story. But for the most part, these kids need fluid first before you do positive pressure ventilation. So wait, fluid resuscitate, and then intubate if needed. So that's it. That's a quick run through of identifying peat sepsis and of those first steps that you take for your clinical management. Um, if you want more on the subject, there is an amazing podcast um, on emergency medicine cases that goes through this much more fully, includes talk about pressors, includes talk about the evidence for steroids and peds. Um, and so I highly recommend that you listen to that podcast to get more of the clinical information. The next thing that I want to talk about are the pieces of this case where there were errors and things that could have been improved. And it all kind of centers around Rory's discharge. And so when you are thinking about discharging a patient, I want you to ask yourself three questions. Are there abnormal vital signs that I haven't assessed, that I haven't charted about, that I haven't rechecked? Are there diagnostic studies that I don't know the answer to or that are abnormal and I've not addressed them in the chart? And finally, have I communicated? Have I communicated with everybody involved in this case, including the patient, including their family? So in Rory's case, if you'll remember, he had abnormal vital signs all the way through. And in the chart, while they were printed and listed, they were really never addressed. There was a study that was done in 2007 and in annals that looked at people who had unexpected deaths within seven days of their ED discharge. And one of the main predictors of that were people being discharged with abnormal vital signs. Now, this study started with kids 10 and up and included adults, so Rory would have been included in that study. You have to address abnormal vital signs. It is a predictor of badness. And if you've got a patient that every single time they come in, they're tachycardic, if you have a patient that you think the fever explains it, put it in the chart. But you cannot just discharge people with abnormal vital signs without it being addressed in some way. The second thing is to make sure that you know the results of all the diagnostic tests that have been ordered. That was another primary error in this case. While the white count of 14 might not have gotten anyone's attention, I think that the 53% bands would. It would have at least made you pause. What I don't know is, did this physician even know these labs have been ordered? At your shop, is there a way that you can have protocolized orders to where blood is sent, things are done without you even knowing? And if so, how can you fix that? What's your personal system when you order something to make sure that you've gone back and seen every one of those results before a patient is discharged out the door. And the final thing about this case that I think that we could have done better is communication. If you look through the case, there's time after time after time again when communication could be improved. There was no call from the pediatrician to the ED. There's no record that that physician was told when someone documented abnormal vital signs in the chart after the patient had been discharged. There's no evidence that anyone went back to that provider and said, hey, did you know he's still febrile? Hey, did you know he's still tachycardic? The lab didn't communicate with those abnormal vital signs. They didn't call anyone. No one told Dory's family. No one told Dory's pediatrician. There are so many things we can do in this case as examples to improve communication. And then what can you do personally? Is it that you're not communicating yourself, or is that maybe people don't want to communicate with you? Are you giving off signs that you're too busy, that you're aloof, that you're distracted, to where your staff doesn't want to take that extra effort and come give you the clinical information that they have? What can you do to be more open, more approachable? So again, ways that we can improve knowledge, recognition, and communication. And then finally, at a system level. So could that have been your emergency department? 
Um, at this location, it doesn't seem like they had any kind of protocol at triage to identify peed sepsis. Again, since this case happened through the Rory Staunton Foundation, there have been legislation and a lot of movements to where many emergency departments now have both changed their triage protocol as well as their discharge protocol. Why did the lab take three hours to come back for a CBC? That's a systems issue. And then we already talked about that there was no communication between the pediatrician and the hospital, between the pediatrician and the emergency department. And so how do you do handoffs at your place? Is there anything that's standardized? Would that have made a difference in this case? So for, for Rory's sake, here's the things you can do. You can plan to do better. You can stay up to date about sepsis. You can analyze your processes, and especially when considering high-risk discharges, and you can identify ways to improve. Just before I left to come to Dublin, I actually got an email from Maury's mom uh, thanking us, thanking SMAC for having this talk. And in it, she wrote that Rory was a proud, young Irish-American boy, and that he would be so proud that he was being discussed in Dublin. I want to thank you guys for letting me tell his story and for getting to speak here today. Thanks, Joanne, for a fascinating talk. Um, I had, just had a question about why you think as doctors and nurses that patients have to die before we look at system processes to stop it. It seems to me to be the wrong way around. Why are we reactive and not more proactive? Um, I think that's a great question. And uh, one of those headlines says, why can't medicine fix its simple problems? I mean, people that are not in our field look at this and say, all, all the data was there. Why couldn't you guys figure it out? And I think it's because we're focusing on the wrong things. I mean, there, our attention is just spread. There's so many regulations. There's charting. Um, we're pulled in so many directions that we're just missing the basics, that we are discharging people not knowing their results. We're discharging people with abnormal vital signs. Thanks. What do we have on Twitter, Chris? Yeah, there was a question about whether you perceive there to be a conflict between investigating these errors and learning from them and any ongoing litigation? Um, so that is, that is challenging. And again, I will tell you that there was a primary accusation about this New York Times article that the author of the article was very good friends with this patient and family. In fact, the patient, I think, had spent weeks at their summer home together. Um, and certainly, I know that uh, legal action was being taken, though I don't personally know any details of that. The reason though, that I was willing to get involved in this case is that they fully handed over the medical records. And so I just don't think we can ignore the facts that are there. And I think we're doing the wrong thing if we only concentrate on the media aspect and don't concentrate on ways that we can do better. And there are ways that we can do better. I mean, this happened at one of our large academic centers. There's ways we can do better. Thank, Thank you, guys. Great. Thanks very much, Joanna.